instead of turning your back, I'm going to use the version in the back of the Trinity. I'm going to turn to chapter 17 of our confession. <clears throat> Which it is on page 679. 679 in the Trinity. And I'm going to read through the chapter since it's been a while. Chapter 17 of the Perseverance of the Saints. Those whom God hath accepted in the Beloved, effectually called and sanctified by His Spirit, and given the precious faith of His elect unto, can neither totally nor finally fall from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end, and be eternally saved, seeing the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, whence he still begets and nourisheth in them faith, repentance, love, joy, hope, and all the graces of the Spirit unto immortality. And though many storms and floods arise and beat against them, yet they shall never be able to take them off that foundation and rock, which by faith they are fastened upon. Notwithstanding, through unbelief and the temptations of Satan, the sensible sight of the light and love of God may for a time be clouded and obscured from them, yet he is still the same, and they shall be sure to be kept by the power of God unto salvation, for they shall enjoy their purchased possession, they being engraved upon the palm of his hands, and their names having been written in the book of life, from all eternity. This perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election, flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father, upon the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ and the union with him, the oath of God, the abiding of his spirit, and the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace, from all which ariseth also the certainty and infallibility thereof. And though they may, through the temptation of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of means of their preservation, fall into grievous sins, and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, come to have their graces and comforts impaired, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Yet they shall renew their repentance and be preserved through faith in Christ Jesus to the end. Praise God for that truth. Amen. Let's pray. God, the one whom we praise, for this truth, that you are the, the God who preserves his saints so that they persevere to the end. There's no God like you. Salvation belongs to you alone, and we ask you as the living and true God that you would bless us, that we would be granted a greater understanding of what you have so graciously revealed to us about your, your, your plan of redemption, your work of salvation in your Thank you for Jesus Christ, who is none of all that you have given him, Father. Thank you that we are counted amongst them. We ask that we would honor you, God, as we apply ourselves to understand this truth. May it affect the way we live this week as we go out from here. May it be more than, than facts that we obtain, but a greater conviction and zeal for you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. So this is the uh, third and final lesson in our study of the 17th chapter of our confession. Um, and we read the whole thing because it's been a little while since we were in this chapter or in the confession at all. And for the same reason, we're going to do a quick review just to be reminded of 
what we have covered so far. In part one, this is part three, we had two lessons before this. In part one, we saw that the definition of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints has a negative and positive element. The, the confession gives us a definition for this doctrine, and within that definition, there's a negative and positive element. Stated negatively, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints says that those whom God hath accepted in the beloved, that is Jesus Christ, those who are accepted in Jesus Christ, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit and given the precious faith of his elect unto, can neither totally nor finally fall from a state of grace. It says rather beautifully that though many storms and floods arise and beat against them, yet they shall never be able to, uh, to take them off that foundation and rock which by faith they are fastened upon that foundation and rock being Jesus Christ. So the saints of God cannot fall away from a state of grace, cannot fall away from salvation. Stated positively, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints declares that true believers shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. In other words, when someone is saved by God, when someone has true salvation, when they are really a Christian by faith in Jesus Christ, they will never lose <clears throat> their salvation, but they will cling to the immovable rock of Christ until the storm of this life is over and they are brought safely to rest in that beautiful land where there is joy in the presence of God forever. That is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. In the second lesson, <clears throat> the question was posed as to the foundation of the saint's perseverance. So we, we know from lesson one what perseverance is, how it is defined and what it is, but what is the foundation of the saint's perseverance? And it is undeniable, as, as we're just hearing the chapter being read through and as you heard the definition uh, be divided into the negative and positive aspects, it's undeniable undeniable that there are two parties working and active in salvation. Uh, that can't be denied. Both God and man are active and working in salvation. Were someone to ask us, which one is it? Does God preserve, uh, preserve his saints in salvation, or do his saints persevere in salvation? Our answer would be, hopefully, I prefer everyone here not hesitating and unironic, yes. Right? Both. Both are indeed true. God preserves and his saints persevere. The will of the Christian is active, really, actually clinging, really believing, really hoping, really trusting, really convicted, really repentant, really sorrowful for sin, really yearning for the holiness without which no one will see God. And yet, salvation belongs not to man, but to God. As it is true that the will of the creature, the creature is active in salvation, <clears throat> so it is true that God and not man saves. God saves, not man. God really is sovereign. He really has decreed and ordained whatsoever comes to pass, including the salvation and particular redemption of his people. God really chooses whom he will save. He really causes them to be born again, taking out their stony hearts and giving them hearts of flesh. God really changes the will of the one upon whom he acts in salvation. So God preserves and man perseveres. Both are true, but which is the foundation? That was the question of lesson two. God or man? And the clear answer from the Bible and that which is confirmed in our confession is that the foundation of our salvation and of our perseverance in particular is not the will of man, but God himself. So we, we do not, we don't have to deny that man is actually active in salvation. He, his will is active, he actually does desire to be saved, he truly desires holiness. Uh, but that does not change the fact that the will of man is not the foundation of salvation. God himself is. God's will is the foundation. It is according to his good pleasure that we are saved, that he might be glorified through our salvation. 
And since he does not change, as we've already seen several times today, wonderfully, what he has determined to come to pass, he will bring about. He will complete the good work he has begun in his people. But someone might argue that it is by their faith that they are fastened to the rock. So if their faith fails, though the foundation be sure, they may be lost. So they may, they may say, that, yes, I, I certainly do not deny that uh, Christ is the rock. He is the foundation. He can't be moved. He is unchanging. But I, am, uh, I cling to him by my faith. So can't it fail? Well, such opponents of salvation... And of the glory of God, forget that our very faith is a gift of God. Our faith is not made of ourselves, but is forged and fashioned in heaven. It is made of stuff that is not of this world, and so nothing in this world can destroy it. Our faith, even, is not of ourselves, but is a gift of God. Had Frodo and Sam brought and relied upon rope from the Shire, they would have been lost. They received a gift from another land, one outside their own, elven twine, and so they were preserved. Had the prophet Elijah mounted some stagecoach made by human hands, he would never have been able to, to evade death. But he was born to heaven by a fiery chariot sent by God. And though we're not told directly, I think I know who his pilot was, by the way, but there's only one mediator between God and man. The imagery there is wonderful of Elijah's ascension to heaven. His, his transportation had to be from heaven. Right? His transportation had to be from heaven. He, he was certainly willing to be with God, of course. Elijah desired to be with his God, longed to be with his God as every saint does. But he was born up. He did not drive the chariot. He was active. Presumably he stepped into the chariot. He was there, he was ready, but he was not the pilot. And so it is with our faith. It is sent to us from heaven, and so bears us back from whence it came. Therefore it is the fashioner and giver of our faith who is the foundation of our perseverance, not ourselves. And that is a comforting thought. However, however, we must beware. For all the comfort this doctrine affords, it must not be used as an excuse to keep on sinning. Those who do so bring much pain upon themselves in this life, as we will see in this final lesson. This lesson is titled, A Warning to Backsliders, A Word of Comfort to the Penitent Waiver. Let's, uh, let's read the Final paragraph of this chapter once more says that will be our main focus. We will continue. And though they may, through the temptation of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them and the neglect of means of their preservation, fall into grievous sins and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve his Holy Spirit, come to have their graces and comforts impaired, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves, yet they shall renew their repentance and be preserved through faith in Christ Jesus to the end. While the ultimate motivation for perseverance ought to be love for God, amen, that, that should be our greatest motivation of our, in all things, that should be what drives us, what motivates us, love for God, simply because he is worthy. The, though that ought to be our greatest, our ultimate motivation, the Bible adds, and the confession lists several uh, minor and uh, temporal motivations or consequences for backsliding to teach us to avoid it, to teach us to avoid falling into grievous sin. These are words to the wise, that they might hear, increase learning, and obtain guidance, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. 
They are gracious warnings that you would escape, that you, each of you here today, if you listen, if you hear the truth of God's word today, that you would escape the sorrows of the one who rejects counsel. Your God loves you, saints. We, your pastors and your brothers, love you. We would not that you would groan at the end of your life when your flesh and your body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Sad picture. He's in the midst of the assembled congregation here. This is in the midst of God's people. So much opportunity. So much access to joy and grace and blessing and life. And yet, because he would not uh, hearken to reproof, because he would not be taught, he is undone. Instead, may God grant that by these merciful cautions you might, in finding wisdom, find life. And obtain favor from the Lord. Proverbs 8.35 There are five consequences you might have noticed for backsliding given in this paragraph. Five consequences. And I'll, go, I'll list them quickly and then um, and we'll go, go through them one at a time. Number one, incurring God's displeasure and grieving the Holy Spirit. Number two, impaired graces and comforts. Number three, hardened hearts and wounded consciences. Number four, hurting and scandalizing others. And number five, other temporal judgments. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 teaches that the failures of those whose actions are recorded in God's word happened as examples for us and were written down for our instruction. That's what God's word says to us. What, what, uh, the failures and the successes, really, but the focus there is on the failures of those who have gone before us. Uh, those things happened, not just recorded, but they, they were decreed to, to come to pass so that the church of God would learn, that they could, could be made wise, would learn from the mistakes, the sins, the failures of those who have gone before, so that they would be instructed, instructed by what has been written down. So let us then take warning and learn from the life of one who, by painful experience, came to see the truthfulness of what we are considering this afternoon. In 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, you can turn to these various passages if you like. We'll spend some more time in some than others. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, we have the rejection of King Saul in the sight of God. Because Saul had not kept the commandment of the Lord his God, verse 13, Samuel the prophet says that Saul's kingdom will end. God has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Now, most of you don't probably know the story. You know already who is being referred to, who this princes that will be placed over the people of God, who this uh, man is that is described here as one who is after God's own heart. But if you don't know the story, uh, the answer is given just, just really quickly in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Acts 13, 22. There, the apostle Paul, speaking to the religious leaders of the synagogue in Pisidia, uh, and teaching them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, said, verse 21, the people of Israel asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. So King David... King David is the man after God's own heart, who God said he had sought and found in first Samuel. It's King David. He's, he's the one uh, whose life we're going to study and, and by God's grace learn from this afternoon. And I wanted to begin with that particular introduction to David, first of all, because uh, I don't presume today that anybody, that everybody knows these different people from the Bible. 
hopefully some things like this will kind of whet your appetite to go back and look at you. At least if this is the first time you're hearing of these stories. But because I want to, more so, more so than that, because I wanted it to be clear that the one whose life we're about to learn from was a believer. I wanted to make sure that was very clear at the outset. We're going to learn from the life of someone who was a believer. Okay? Someone who was a saint, one of the elect. He is, David is, is one who is saved. He is in the presence of God even now. He is a saint who persevered. So we're not talking this afternoon about those of whom there are many in East Texas who say that they are Christians but who walk in complete lawlessness. That's not, that's not who we're talking about today. We're not talking about blasphemers, those who bear the name of Christ calling themselves Christians but who live for sin. We aren't talking about those diseased trees who bear only bad fruit. We're talking about a good tree. One who is described as we read as one who is after God's own heart. David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man who delighted in the law of God and who meditated upon it day and night. A man who wrote the majority of the Psalms. If you didn't know that, King David wrote the majority of the Psalms that we sing in the Bible. A man who was zealous for good works. A man who, by the grace of God, loved God. As he says in one of his songs, I love you. This is who David is. He was a man who I don't think anyone here can measure up to. Okay? That's who we're describing. That's who we're learning from today. Not some reprobate. This is the worst case story. This is a man who was, a, who was after God's own heart. And yet for all of that, this was a man who at the end of the day was still a man, and one who blundered terribly. David is an example to us whose life was recorded for our instruction, as he is one who, to use the words of the confession, fell into grievous sins, and for a time continued there. Who also renewed his repentance, and was preserved through faith in Christ Jesus. Go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel, chapter 11. Second Samuel, chapter 11. What we're about to read is the sad story of the fall of David, king of Israel, a man after God's own. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war was doing. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him, a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Or 
Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here also, today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fight, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. And Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger arises, and if he says to you, Why did you go so, so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall, so that he died at Thebes? Why do you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent to him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. And the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Joab, do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage it. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to, her, to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done pleased the Lord. Covetousness, adultery, deceit, murder, sin begets sin begets sin. Now the, the world will tell you that such things are desirable. Our movies and TV shows are full of examples of Sins like the ones we just read of, and very often the one who commits them is depicted in such a way as to uh, excuse his transgression, or there's some reason he acted out the way he did. Uh, they try to excuse the sins, and the story is written in such a way that it ends well with the transgressor. Two people commit adultery, and then they ride off into the sunset together like it's fine. But remember, I don't know if I'll ever grow tired of, of using this language. We need to be reminded of it weekly. Remember, the world is a painted cheat. She lies. What God has inspired, that it might be recorded for our instruction, is that things do not go well with those who fall into grievous sin. Did all, did all end well for David? Or did he experience the consequences of backsliding that are listed in the confession? Be sure, brother or sister, that whatever happened to David will happen to you in similar manner. If you, through the temptation of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of, of corruption remaining in you, and the neglect of the means of your preservation, fall into grievous sins and for a time continue in them, you are not greater than David. We are not greater than David. We, in our sin, we want to tell ourselves, right? that it'll be different with us. Yes, others suffer uh, temporal judgments. Others, uh, for others, it doesn't work out well when they sin. But for me, it's going to work out this time. 
I'll be the exception to the rule. Do we choose to believe the lies of the world and our own folly, or we can choose to believe the Scripture? The first consequence for David in his falling into grievous sin was the incurring of God's displeasure and the grieving of his Holy Spirit. The final words of the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel show us that this consequence is the first and immediate result of grievous sin. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Before anything else came to pass, before uh, any other judgment is described, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And that really makes sense, doesn't it? Because uh, from whom do judgments come? Who is the one that deals these out? But God. So necessarily he would be, he would first be displeased, and then the judgments would come from him. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. This is the first and immediate consequence. And it is also the most terrible. It is also the most awful. In the next chapter of 2 Samuel, we read, we see the rebuke of David by Nathan the prophet. We're going to read, I'm going to read the first 13. I was a lot of reading today. But remember, this is for our instruction. The first 13 verses of chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city. So Nathan's a prophet. He came to the King David. I'm going to give him a parable, a story. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly. And I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. Now surely David knew that in all this mess he sinned against others as well. But what was his response? I have sinned against the Lord. Had he not also sinned against his servants by using them in his wicked plan? To bring Bathsheba to them. He used his servants to do it. They seemed to have some idea what was going on. They're like, actually, uh, that's someone else's wife. And he uses them. He sends them to bring her to him. Surely, this caused them to violate their own consciences since they knew she was married. And surely, this brought scandal into the, house, the king's house. Had he not sinned against Bathsheba by luring her to, her to commit adultery against her husband? Perhaps using though it does not justify her, perhaps using the power structure to coerce her into, he's the king, right? 
I'm going to do it. I have to obey the king. Had he not sinned against Joab by drawing him into the plot to murder Uriah? Had he not sinned against Uriah by murdering him? Had he not sinned against the whole nation by ruling in this wickedly and ca causing the people to mourn? And yet his only response to Nathan the prophet was, I have sinned against the Lord. Turn now to Psalm 51 in your Bibles. Psalm 51 is titled, A Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, Psalm 51. So we see the direct context, we see what's going on here. As soon as David is convicted, all, all, that, we're gonna, all that we could read in Psalm 51, if we read it all the way through, is, is what's going on in the heart and mind of David. In Psalm 51, David goes as far as to say in verse 4, we saw him say here, respond to Nathan, uh, I have sinned against the Lord. He goes as far as to say in verse 4, against you, this is David praying to God, speaking to God, writing to God, against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Again, we ask, is David somehow ignorant, somehow completely blinded to the fact that he had sinned against others? No. What he is expressing here is what every true believer knows. That since God is perfect, pure, supreme, infinite, holy, majestic, since God is all these and more infinitely, his sins, the sins of the believer against others are really has nothing compared to his sins against his God. Because of who, who God is, because of how great he is, how completely other, our sins against him, our sins against others are, are really as, as nothing compared to our sin, how our sins are against our God. It is similar to how the Lord Jesus said, if anyone comes to me, this is Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Compared to how much we love the Lord Jesus, other loves should see this hate. He's not, obviously he's not teaching here that we should hate others as we normally would think of it. What is going on here is our Lord is saying that compared to how much you love me, all other relationships ought to be a vastly in itself. There should be no competition. If, if, you, if you had to compare them, it would almost look like what you have for me is love, and what you have for them is hate. Our love for him is to be ultimate, without even distant seconds. If we're to love others, we are to love them in him, because we love him in obedience to him. Okay? That's, that's how we are to love others. In Christ, because we love Christ, out of obedience to Christ. All allegiances must bow to the foremost devotion we have to our King, and in the same way our sins are seen as if they are against God and God alone. The greatest grief, the most terrible sorrow for the believer is knowing that he has sinned against the God whom his soul loves, that he has grieved the Spirit who has been given to him, been given to him as a guarantee of his salvation. When the believer is brought to the conviction that he has sinned against the Lord, he no longer feels his presence. He has a profound sense of his own uncleanness. Joy and gladness can no longer be heard. He cannot sing for sorrow of heart. These are, these are how David, a man after God's own heart, described what it is like to become aware that God's displeasure has been incurred in the Holy Spirit. Perhaps in your one time today, you can read through Psalm 51 and you'll see that kind of language there. David, no longer feeling the presence of God, having a profound sense of his own uncleanness, joy and gladness, he says he can no longer hear. He can't sing for sorrow of heart. Confession calls this the impairing of one's graces and comforts. 
the impairing of one's graces and comforts, and that's the second consequence for backsliding. David compared his conviction to having broken bones. Again, we see in Psalm 51. His conviction was like broken bones in his body. He sensed an inward crookedness, asking God to renew a right spirit within him. He felt crooked inside. He felt cast away, weak, so that he asked to be upheld and bound fast by his blood guiltiness, so that he asked to be delivered from it. All of these are very apt descriptors of what it means to have our graces and our comforts impaired. The world tries to tell you that the sexually immoral are strong, but David was weakened by his sin. And there is none mightier than Christ the righteous. That's the truth. The flesh lies and says that freedom is found in doing what satisfies one's illicit desires, but David was a slave to his sin, in reality. And Jesus, who always did the will of the Father, even when it meant going against his own desires, saying, Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is Lord, mastered by none. The devil deceives so that we are tempted to think that sin will satisfy, but David was empty after accomplishing his iniquity. And Jesus, the innocent, was so content in God that he could live without bread, so long as he had every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. So, brother or sister, would you avoid the impairment of your graces and comforts? Take heed lest you fall. Let us all take heed lest we fall. Do not neglect the means of your preservation, prayer, meditation upon God's word, the gathering together of believers, regular confession of lesser sins. The great sins follow the lesser ones. There is no misery quite like that which a believer experiences after he gives in to sin. There is no misery quite like that which the believer experiences after he gives in to sin. Is that true? Yeah. The death of a loved one, sickness, disappointments in life, all of these are difficult pills to swallow, but their bitterness accompanied their bitterness is accompanied with the sweetness of God's presence quite often. Right? When we have someone pass away, or when we're sick. Those difficulties often are accompanied with uh, the sweetness of knowing that God is near. But that is not felt in sin. That is not felt in sin. <clears throat> we took note earlier that sin begets sin. This is because one of the consequences of backsliding is the hardening of one's heart and the wounding of one's conscience, which is the third result of sin given in the confession. Do you think that the man after God's own heart could easily have been enticed to murder the day before he saw Bathsheba on the rooftop? Probably not. Right? Someone who, who God himself, the Holy God, described as a man after his own heart. Do you think it was just from there, from like a position of uprightness, and then just a moment later he's just off the rails? It's doubtful. Each choice to sin was like a winter wind which slowly but surely froze his heart. That's the, process, that's the progress of sin. In fact, he was so hardened, David was so hardened by the end that he was unable to see that the prophet Nathan's parable was about him. Right? At first he couldn't even see that Nathan was talking about him. That's how hardened he was. That's how deceived he was in his sin. He, he, he was aroused to anger about someone who stole a little ewe lamb. But he was seeing that this is about him. Why, why do you think Nathan's showing up right now? Does Nathan just, does Nathan just show up to tell you stories out of nowhere? Like, that's, how, that's, how, that's the folly of sin. We're blinded, we're hardened by it. But graciously, as Narnia thawed when Aslan returned, bound, bound, but then it breaks. Life, even spring in the lion's wake. <clears throat> As from sea he comes to free the land he once sang into being. Even so, David's heart was melted by the word he heard from his God. 
what took much time, choice after choice, from lusting, coveting, to taking, stealing, to deceit, to enticing others to commit sin, ultimately to murder. Step by step, freezing of his heart, though it took steps in time, all that was melted by the word he heard from his God. Immediately he confessed his wrongdoing, and that is a great blessing from God when he does that, when he brings us to a swift and complete and immediate awareness of our sin. And yet I believe that David's wounded conscience remained with him for the rest of his life. So some things God chooses not to remedy right away. But the hardness of his heart was, he was healed, as it were, almost immediately. He saw his own sinfulness as soon as, as soon as the prophet said, uh, you are the man. All that melted away. And I think that the other consequence that was that's given here, of a wounded conscience, I think that one got allowed to remain with him for the rest of his life. David was unable or unwilling to confront his children when they sinned, perhaps because of this wound. I know some of this requires something of a working knowledge of David's life. If you are aware, you know there were times where David said nothing. His children were in sin, and I wonder if that's because of his wounded conscience or his decision early on. It was the same with Joab, actually, even when Joab was guilty of murder later on. David would not confront him. How could David confront the man he had made an accomplice to the murder of Uriah? Nothing like a, nothing but a hypocrite in his eyes. Some things God heals immediately as the spring rains quickly restore a parched land. Others, he chooses to allow to heal over time. Perhaps so that the wounded one will remember how he came by his injuries and not repeat the folly. The great physician knows every remedy. For David, as we may expect for ourselves, as we fall into grievous sin, uh, there were still more consequences to suffer before the disease can be fully eradicated. The hardening of his heart wounding of his conscience, the latter especially being one that he had to endure for, I think, the rest of his life. But there was also the hurt and scandalizing of others, which is the fourth consequence, the hurt and scandalizing of others. Uh, David's sin had an, an immeasurable impact upon his family, his government, and his nation. Uh, maybe you don't, again, if you don't know much about the, the life and story of David, that might be a good place to jump into a daily reading much to learn from his life. Some of the, the results in his family of his own sin are just terrible. Uh, one of David's daughters would be raped by one of David's sons, who would in turn be killed by another of David's sons. The same son would rise up against David and try to take the kingdom by force. Uh, one of the ways he sought to galvanize his reign was by sleeping with David's concubines on the rooftop of the palace, as God said publicly, though David's sin was done privately, right? this came to pass, what God promised would happen, it came to pass. Possibly David's son did this exactly where um, David looked out and saw Bathsheba. Maybe. Even Solomon, David's wise son, would go on to obtain hundreds of wives and concubines, even eventually being led by some of them to worship their false gods. And when his son reigned, the kingdom was divided. So we see that others are hurt and scandalized by our sins. We must remember that no man is an island. Our sin always impacts those around us. Small sins may seem to have less of an impact, and grievous sins are greater, but all hurt and scandalize others, as we can clearly see in David's life. It really was just a mess. It's really sad to see a man, and what a warning to fathers one who could be described as a man after God's own heart is that his children could be just so utterly debauched in so many ways. So much pain in his home. Today, as in all times, children are raised in homes broken by adultery. Boys grow up without fathers and girls without mothers. Parents suffer shame and reproach for the sins of their children. That which was made by God to be such a blessing, the family, can quickly become a curse 
when sin is permitted therein. Our example is the Lord Jesus Christ, who never sinned and therefore never hurt nor scandalized anyone. The greatest example of the hurt and scandal our sins can cause is also our Lord, who suffered for our sins even unto death, and who was mocked and shamed for our transgressions. So let us take hold of wisdom, brethren, and seek by the means of our preservation to avoid hurting or scandalizing one another. We seek to avoid that. Falling into grievous sins means hurting and scandalizing others. Above all, in the name of love, let us reject those things that so hurt and scandalize our Savior. The last consequence in the confession is a rather broad category, Temp temporal judgments, that just means any judgments that could happen in this life, at this time, temporal judgments. Um, the list could be quite long if we took the time. The Bible gives examples of disease, uh, financial ruin, war, famine, pestilence, just to name a few, all sorts of temporal judgments from God for grievous sin. Uh, but perhaps the greatest one that David suffered was the death of his own child. The death of his own child. We stopped reading in 2 Samuel 12, the first part of verse 13, where David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. It goes on to say, And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, you shall not die. Oh, good. It's, it's all done. It's just over, right? No consequences, right? I'm, I'm forgiven. So... We just move on and forget what happened. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And Nathan went to his house. And that is what happened. Bathsheba's son died. As it clearly states here, because David had scorned the Lord. So, take note, Christian, that the reality that you have been saved does not mean that you will not suffer temporal judgments for your sins. Even if you're really sorry, that doesn't mean that God won't allow temporal judgments into your life. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives, Hebrews 12 says. Moses sinned, and he was not able to see the promised land. Jonah sinned, he was swallowed by a great fish. And if you fall into grievous sin, expect that your Heavenly Father, who loves you, will discipline. But wouldn't it be far better to learn from that which God has recorded for our instruction? To not have to suffer temporal judgments. Why suffer needlessly? I suffer needlessly. There's enough suffering in this life, which is not a direct result of our own sins. Why add to the woes of this life? Let us learn now, let us determine today by God's grace to continually utilize the means of our preservation so that we do not fall into grievous sin and suffer its consequences. Amen. So, I think these are five very helpful warnings from God's Word. Warnings in the form of consequences for backsliding that hopefully will be a reminder to us as we go forward to lay hold of those means that God has given us for our preservation, for our perseverance. Let's, let's watch out for one another. Let's pray for one another. Let's be on guard for one another. We don't be a terrible thing to see such judgments befall anyone here because we love one another. It would be awful to watch unfold in someone else's lives and then we certainly don't want to experience them ourselves. So, With the ultimate motivation being first, love for God and love for one another, we would avoid these pains and in wisdom we would seek Seek by God's strength and grace to avoid grievous sin. In conclusion, 
want to offer a word of comfort to the penitent wayward, to those who have fallen into grievous sin and who are truly repentant and sorrowful over it. Some of us, some of you, can look back upon your lives and see their grievous sins. Some of, some of you, some of us perhaps, are still suffering some of the consequences of those choices. Comfort. Comfort the people of God. Peace, child of the Lord. Though the way be painful, it is for your good. There's no, nothing that is allowed to come to pass in the life of a believer is for their hurt, ultimately. Even though it is painful, it is ultimately for your good. And you will be preserved by faith in Christ Jesus to the end. All that God allowed to come to pass in David's life, as terrible as it was, all the consequences for his sins were ultimately for his good, to preserve it so that he would persevere to the end. If you will accept it, it would have been worse for David had those things not come to pass after he sinned. How do we know that? Well, because God did allow them to come to pass. And he works all things together for the good of those who love him. So if you find yourself you are one who has fallen into grievous sins and you have suffered the, their consequences or even are today. Remember that these, even these, are for your good. You will, be, you will be preserved by faith in Christ Jesus to the end. Christ is always a greater Savior than we are sinners. Remember the foundation of your perseverance is not your will, but the rock of Jesus Christ to whom you are fastened. And he does not change. He will be as firm a foundation tomorrow as he is today, and always will be as long as there is a tomorrow. So to those who are here today who are not Christians, I must speak a hard truth to you before I offer you hope. If you're here today and you have not yet called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, the consequences you are suffering, or if you grow up, the consequences that you will suffer for your sins will be nothing compared to the ultimate consequence you will experience if you continue to reject Jesus Christ. Hell awaits you, and from that there is no remedy. Temporal judgments often get better over time. What you thought was unbearable when it first came to pass is now to pass is just now just a distant memory you got caught doing something by your parents that you weren't supposed to do, and the trouble that that felt, and, and the, the upset stomach and all that, the, the, how terrible it was in the moment, it was very bad, but it's already passed. Well, not so with hell. Not so with God's ultimate judgment. Hell's torments are new every morning. What keeps you from holding fast then to the rock that is Christ? What, what is keeping you from doing it? What what is stopping you from laying hold of the hope and the joy, the forgiveness and the cleansing, the reconciliation that is only available in Jesus Christ? As a minister of the gospel, I promise you in the name of God that there has never been a sinner who could out sin Jesus Christ as Savior. You will always be a greater Savior than you are a sinner. Turn to him today and live. He will keep you till the end. Gracious God, we thank you for the warnings you've given us in your word that we might learn by them, we might be instructed by them. And I pray that you would grant here that none of our number would be permitted to fall and to grievous sin and suffer thereby. For though we know that ultimately, as they are saints, it will all be used to your for good, still it is a sorrow for us to behold others whom we love suffering. More than this, we, we do not want to see your name blasphemed amongst the Gentiles, which often happens when a saint falls into grievous sin. So we ask that you would preserve us, that you would strengthen us, that you would keep our feet from slipping. 